Good morning. Come on, y'all. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I asked Pastor if we could have the, the young people come down because I don't want them to see the back of me, but he said they can look on the monitors. How far have we come that we can have church and folks sit anywhere in the house and get a good seat? Amen. It's good to be home. Um, I do want to thank Pastor Bogan for allowing me to stand here today and to all the officers and members, the ministers and the deacons and um, trustees and everybody that's a member of this fine church. Uh, just a quick history for some of those that don't know me. Um, my mother was born and raised in this church. Um, and I was born and raised in this church as well some years ago and God has brought me full circle back so it's, it's good to be here I, I'm praying that uh, something will be said today that will bless us I've already been blessed by the worship it's good to come home and see worship good to come home and see young people worshiping And it's funny, for what was read in the responsive reading and what was read earlier, we're going to kind of touch on the same subject. I know, I think the theme was centering around your identity in Christ, knowing who your identity is in Christ. But we're going to come out of the Old Testament today. And what's been read so far has really been kind of with Moses and, and the children of Israel in Egypt and coming out of Egypt. And we're going to stay there. I didn't know this, but we're going to stay there. And I want you, if you will, to turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. While you're turning, uh, if, if you've got tablets or whatever, I want you to keep them open because I believe that you should stay in the Word. I'll try it again. I believe those Bibles in your pews are to be used or the, the, the Bible app on your tablet and phone should be used. I'm not going to go all over the Bible, but I am going to be in two different places, so I'm going to give them to you now so that you can have them, and then when I read it, you'll have it. Amen? Exodus chapter 4. And I need, really need you just to stay in chapter 4. The whole, keep that one. And also get 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Those are the only two texts that I'm going to be reading from so that you can read it for yourself. I'm a firm believer if you see it, you'll retain it. Some people are visual. Some people are audio. Uh, me, I'm a visual. If I see it, I can remember it. And so, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, but we're going to start with Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm going to start at verse 10. Exodus, yes, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. Exodus 4. We'll go to 2 Corinthians later. Exodus 4. If you're there, say amen. amen. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since have you spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord, please send someone else. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses and he said, what about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and your heart will be glad when he sees you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so you can perform the signs with it. Then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Let me return to my own people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. Jethro said, Go, and I wish you well. Now the Lord had said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all those who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity, and we pray, Lord, your blessing by your spirit right now, that you would illuminate your word so that from the youngest to the oldest, we can get what you have for us. Uh, there's something in this, Lord, that you want us to learn so that we can be better and stronger and wiser. 
So I pray, Lord, that your movement would move within us and then move us to go out and move outside of us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Young people, I need you to talk to me. Y'all with me? I, I don't understand. Y'all with me? Y'all with me? In Exodus 3 and 4, we see Moses at a troubling place. He's struggling to find out what's his call in God. He's, he's struggling to find out what's his purpose in God. And actually, Exodus chapter 4 is the first time that we see Moses actually having a real encounter with God. He, he's coming to a place where he's recognizing who God is for him. And I, and I will challenge, especially not the older young people, but the younger young people, to recognize it's important to know God and have a real encounter with him while you're young. It really is. I know, I know it sounds kind of corny, but it's real. Because the older you get, the more complicated it can get. But when you're younger and you have an encounter with God and realize who he really is to you, it'll help you as you go further, as you go forward. God's trying to convince Moses of his calling. Now, God is the Logos. He's the living word. He, he is the word. But I want to ask you guys, not you guys, I want to ask you guys. Somebody tell me, what's your favorite word? Fruit? Food. I get you. Somebody else. <laughs> Says? Sis. Okay. One more. Believe. Okay. One more. Come on. Shasha. Okay. And you got a word. What's your word? Jesus. Jesus? Well, that's a name. Give me a word. That's a name. Word. Love. Okay question for all of you. If there's such a thing, what do you think might be God's favorite word? Now, don't give me Jesus because I, I said that. That's a name. But if, if there's such a thing as God's favorite word, what might that be? Love. Grace. People. All of those are good. That's not what I'm looking for. When I was coming up, I really kind of thought, honestly, when I was growing up, and not just in this church, but I grew up in this church, I, I kind of really thought maybe one of God's favorite words was don't. <laughs> Stop. No. Because we were taught, and I'm not trying to be smart, really. We were taught in that time more so, not so much grace, but legalism that said it, it emphasized not what God is and does, but what you shouldn't do. It always seemed like if you don't, and God said, and you better, and it just seemed like God was getting off on me doing wrong. But that's not God's favorite word. If you will, I would believe, I would like to believe today, and here's, that's why I didn't give you the title at first. I would like to believe that God's favorite word is yes. And the title of the sermon is just say yes. I believe that God's favorite word is yes to, to his children. I believe that, God, that God's favorite word to hear from his children is yes. And that God's favorite word to say to his children is yes. How many parents out here enjoy saying no? But how many parents get a joy out of when they say yes, seeing the response of their children? How many parents enjoy disciplining their children, though it's necessary? But how many parents enjoy giving a present to their children and watching the light in them? God's favorite word is yes. It's not no. It's not stop. It's not don't. Everything in God is yay and amen. I wish I had somebody help me today. Remember, now, God is calling Moses to lead his people out of Egypt. And when God comes to Moses and tells Moses what he wants him to do, Moses gives God every reason why he can't do it. Moses gets logical on him. He says, I got this, I got that, I don't have this, I don't have that. Moses gives him every excuse. He tells him all about his deficiencies. He tells him all about his dysfunctions. And all God ever wants from Moses, all God ever wants from you, all God ever wants from you is yes. Let me say it like this. 
God already knows about your dysfunction when he chooses you. So God already knows about your dysfunction when he chooses you. He can know about it when he wants to use you. He didn't, stop the, he didn't stop at the dysfunction in choosing you, so why would he stop at the dysfunction in using you? I'm not saying stay in your dysfunction. I'm saying God can use you despite your dysfunction. Second Corinthians, you ready? Second Corinthians chapter 1. I want to see every head down looking, reading something. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. Verse 18. But as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, and I'm reading out of the NIV. If you got the King James, it follows, trust me. Verse 19. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, you'll say Sylvanus, it's Silas, Timothy, it's his Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. God loves to say yes to his children and God loves to hear yes from his children. Even when God has to say no, and hear this young people, because I had to deal with this too. When God has to say no now, it's because he's got a better yes later. How many are almost driving age? Or driving age. Okay. How many want a nice ride? <laughs> How many parents of y'all gave you a car? Yeah, a lot of hands went down. And listen, that's not because the parents don't necessarily want to. That's because in most cases, not even aside from finances, in most cases the parents know they're not ready yet. So God's no now is so he can prepare you for the yes later, which is better when you're ready for it. There's some stuff God wants for you, but you, you, now y'all ain't even driving age. But he wants you to drive one day, so he's going to tell you no now, because if he lets you drive now, you, you hurt somebody. But when you get older, you can get a car, and you can... And then God's yes is better. Amen? So we want to recognize that when God is saying no, it's because he's got a better yes, but God always is yes and amen. Quiet up in here. Amen. We're going to get past that teaching that tells you that God is a God that sits up high and looks low and just waits for you to mess up. Because some of us were raised in that thinking, that's what God does. He's waiting for you to mess up, and he only wants to focus on what you do wrong. And God is your biggest cheerleader and wants to lift you up and do more. Moses' problem is a little different than y'all. Moses is 80 years old. God is calling Moses at 80 years old. Moses is a murderer. He's been on the run. He's been tending stinky sheep for the last 40 years. He's on the backside of the desert with his, with his father-in-law, Jethro. He's gotten married and had some kids. And he's settled in to just mediocrity. He's got no vision and no real goals. He's content being an ex-murderer or really still a murderer. If he goes back to Egypt, he knows he really can't go back to Egypt because he killed somebody. So Moses has different, Moses is at a disadvantage that you guys don't have. One of the major reasons that the military will draft young men and women now is because, not just because you're younger and physically stronger, it's because you have less encumbrances. You have less problems. And you're, and you're more moldable and shapeable in your mind. Because at 18, when the drill sergeant tells you to do something, you aren't smart enough to tell him, I ain't going to. But when you're 35, 40, and you got a mortgage, and you got a wife, and you got a son, and you got bills, you ain't going to necessarily say yes. And so God wants your yes in your youth. God wants your yes in your youth. Because if he can, just like the military, if he can shape you in your youth, then when you get older, you're going to be the best soldier there is. Right. 
Moses is deliberating, and he's, he's trying to figure out, God, you're calling me. I don't quite know who you are, and, and, and I've got all these decades of living with my dysfunction, and, and, and I'm a mess, and, and I know you are calling me, but what are you going to do with me? So the first question I want you to see, there's three questions real quick we're going to go through. The first question in this yes thing is, will I be what God made me? Will I be what God made me? This test is called the accept test, acceptance test. First, you got to accept Christ to know what God made you to be. And secondly, you've got to accept yourself. Ah, you've got to accept yourself. Moses said to God, who are you? God said, I am. He said, okay, um, okay, you are who? And God said, I'm whoever you need me to be. For whatever you need me to do, I am. Now, I know Moses probably had a problem with that because he had never really known God. He had seen the Israelites in Egypt. He knew they worshiped this God, but he doesn't have an encounter with this God till he's 80 years old and he's a murderer. And now God tells him, I am anything and everything you need me to be so that you can be what I want you to be. And, and I believe that Moses starts to get an understanding of who God is, but the problem is what he doesn't have an understanding of or an acceptance of is who he is. See, I need you to know something. To be used of God, you've not only got to accept Christ, but you've got to accept that you are who God made you to be and that he can use you despite what you once were or, or think you will be. Some of us have an easier time accepting God than we have accepting ourselves. Moses had a stuttering problem. He stuttered and God said, I want you to free my people. Let's keep it real. Nobody's going to be comfortable doing that. Nobody's going to feel confident doing that. Nobody's going to feel acceptable doing that. And so I can believe that when God called Moses and said, I want you to go free my people, and Moses knows he's got this dysfunction and he's had it for a long time, and he's a murderer and he can't go back, Moses is trying to get logical and say, look, look God, I hear you. You mean well. I, I get that. You are. You're everything I need. But if you are that God, I need you to change my tongue so you can use me. And God says, no, I'm not going to change your tongue. You're still going to stammer. I'll just teach you how to talk. I'll use your stammer. I'll use your brother to help you talk. Your brother Aaron, he speaks real well. I'll send him with you. He can help you out. But I'm going to use you too. He said, and you're going to speak to Aaron in such a way, Aaron's going to think he's talking to me. But I stutter, God, you can't use me. He said, I knew you were stuttering before I called you. He can say yes to the great I am, but he can't say yes to himself. See, somewhere along the line, you're going to have to say yes to yourself, even in your dysfunction, and trust that God can move past your dysfunction and get what he wants out of you. Yes, Lord, I'll say yes to you even though I'm broken. Yes, Lord, I'll say yes to you even though my parents are divorced. Yes, Lord, I'll say, I'll say yes to you even though I have body image issues oh not y'all yes Lord I'll say yes to you even though there's a girl that I think is prettier than me in school yes Lord I'll say yes to you even though there's a guy that's stronger and built better than me in school yes Lord I'll say yes because if you've called me as I am I'm good enough for you so I'm good enough for what it is I wish I was more popular. Everybody's got a wish list. I wish I was this. I wish I was that. Man, why can't I be if I was this? And God says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made just as you are. I will tell you that doubting yourself 
when God has told you something, it's not showing humility. I'll say it again. Doubting yourself when God has told you something is not showing humility. In fact, let me see if I can say it this way. When you reject the product, you insult the manufacturer. You go to dinner. You say you want a steak a certain way. Chef makes the steak, and he makes it his way. Hold on. He brings it to you. They bring it to you, and you say, that's not what I want. And you say, send it back. Chef gets insulted because chef being a cook knows the best way for you to enjoy the flavor and the essence of that steak. And you want it burned and charred <laughs> and well done insults his product. God has made you just the way you are. And when somebody rejects you, they are rejecting the manufacturer that made you the way you are. You're not supposed to be a carbon copy of somebody else. You're supposed to be different. You're going to be different. And kids in school are going to see that you're different. If the light of Christ is in you, you're going to be different. Some are tall. That's okay. Some are short. That's okay. Some are dark skinned. That's okay. Some are light skinned. That's okay. Some are white. That's okay. Some are black. That's okay. The bottom line is, as God has made you, let him show his product through you. The greatest test is not the test to accept God's strength, but the greatest test is the strength to accept your weakness. And God says, when you accept your weakness, then I can give you my strength. But if you only see my strength, then you won't see your weakness. If you don't see your weakness, you can't get my strength. For every no that you think about yourself, God's got a better yes. For every no that somebody projects on you, you've got to turn it down. This is what happens when you don't know who you are. I was in school once, believe it or not. At that time, I had hair. <laughs> because you're at an age, not just your age, don't tell them, them too, where you want to be accepted, what happens when you're not content in who you are, you start projecting an image of something you want people to think that you are that's not you. What happens then is, don't tell nobody, we're talking about you. People start to like you for the image you project, never getting to know you. So then they fall in love or they like you for what you projected. And sooner or later, they're going to see who you really are. And if you don't like who you really are, They ain't going to like who you really are. So then you're going to wonder, why am I broken and why am I friendless and why are people talking about me? Because you didn't have the guts to just be who you are. They're going to talk about you anyway, so you might as well let them talk about you being who you are. Some are going to like you. Some are not going to like you. Some are going to want to hang with you. Some are not going to hang with you. The key is be true to who you are in Christ. Just say yes. yes. Just say yes. yes. God never asked for your perfection. Oh, you're different. You think it is. I don't think I'm anything. I'm just a child of God. Oh, so you think you're perfect. I've never called myself perfect. And God didn't call me perfect. And God's not looking for perfection. He's just looking for my yes. All he wants is my yes. He'll work it out if I say yes. If I mean yes, he'll work it out. And you also have to accept your limitations. And that's okay. Everybody ain't going to sing like Burt Morgan. You need to just accept that. That's okay. Because if you can't sing like Miss Burt, there's something God has given you to do. 
Don't try to exceed what God has given you. Be you. See, here's the, here's the issue. Miss Bird's being Miss Bird. Now you're trying to be Miss Bird. We don't need another Miss Bird. We got Miss Bird. We don't need another Pastor Bogan. We, we got Pastor Bogan. Listen, I tell people all the time, I ain't Creflo Dollar. I ain't Joel Osteen. But I can do Wilbur Phillips real good all day long. All day, all day long. I can do Wilbur Phillips pretty good. I, I, I'm okay with him. Now, whether you're okay with him, that's between you and God, because me, I'm okay with him. There's some things I don't like about him, but God says, give me your yes and I'll work it out. Oh, y'all ain't hear me. Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied, or a rod. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out, took hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak. When he took it out, the skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. Now put it back into your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, if they do not believe you or pay attention to the first sign, they may believe the second. But if they do not believe these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the ground, on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Moses is not only being asked to accept who he is, who God is and who he is, but now he's being asked to use what he has. And Moses has been tending to sheep for 40 years. He doesn't have weapons. He doesn't have a piece on him. He doesn't have a knife on him. All he's got is a staff. God wants you to lead the children of Israel somewhere, and all you got is a staff. Doesn't seem like you got much to work with. God says, what do you got? He said, I got a staff. He said, okay, throw the staff down. Can I share something with you? When God tells you to throw something down on the ground, that means throw it down and leave it there. That means when God tells you to throw your attitude on the ground. When God tells you to throw certain relationships on the ground. It's quiet in here. When God tells you to throw certain habits on the ground. God says throw it on the ground. Moses throws it on the ground. And Moses is kind of like me. I'm not a snake guy. That staff throws into a snake. Now, honestly, I'm going to be like Moses. I'm gone. And God said, listen, listen, I, I need you to get this. Listen, he says, I need you to go pick it up, but I need you to pick it up by its tail. Y'all ain't catch that part. Anybody knows anything about a snake? You want to grab that snake, if you're going to grab it at all, by its head. Because you can control where it can move its fangs. You grab it by its tail, and it curls around, and it's got your wrist. So it's going to take some kind of faith to pick up what God told you to throw down, but to pick it up and it become a different thing because by faith you've grabbed something by its tail and not in your control, not in your way, not in your time, not in your pleasure, but in God's way, you trust him enough to pick it up by the tail and it not bite you. Sounds easy, right? It ain't easy. I'd still be running. God said, pick it up. And it didn't turn back to the staff until he reached for it, the Bible says. Listen to me. I need you to get this. Listen to me, especially y'all. There's some stuff God's got for you, and he's going to tell you to leave it alone, and then he's going to tell you to revisit it. And when he tells you to revisit it, you're going to have to, by faith, revisit it, even though it doesn't look like it's something you should re revisit. If it's God telling you there's something he's going to do to show you, that, and he did it, to show you that it's him, but you've got to trust. Listen, can I say this? You've got to say yes to God before the question. 
God wants your yes before he gives you the question. Because when he gets your yes before the question, he knows you believe him. See, if you only say yes based on the question, then he knows you're kind of leaning to what you know, what you like, what you got. But if you say yes to God and mean it, then God says, I can change that snake back because you trust me. Because, again, I'm a good dad, and I don't want to see you hurt, and I don't want to harm you. I only want, really, what's best for you. So God gives Moses three signs of authority to take back to Israel. Verse 2. He tells him to drop the rod. What's God saying? I can change what you have if you let it go. Verse 6, he puts his hand in his vest, takes it out. It's white as snow. It's leprosy. We don't know nothing about leprosy now, but leprosy was a deadly disease back in that day, and it would kill you. And if you had it, you couldn't be around folk. You had to go on a leper's colony, a leper's island. You couldn't be around people because it was contagious. So he put his hand in, pulled it out, and it was leprous. And I'm sure Moses was really messed up with that. So he put his hand back in, he pulled it out, and it was just like, and God says, not only can I change what you have if you let it go, I can change you. He says, but if they don't believe the first two, he says, when you go get some water out of the Nile, pour it on dry land, he said, I'm going to make that water turn into blood. Not only can I change what you have if you let it go, not only can I change you, but I can change things. All these things I can do, but it's only if you're available. It's only if you say yes. It's only if you pick the, the snake up by the tail. It's only if you'll go back to Egypt because you're stuck on the backside of Midian. Do you believe me enough in 10th grade, 9th grade, 7th grade, 4th grade, 3rd grade, 2nd grade? Do you believe me enough that even though you're different, that you can accept that I am who I am in you? And that because if I am, then you are my children. And if I am everything, then everything I am can be in you to be what you need to be that I want you to be. Amen. See, Moses got that I am, but Moses couldn't get that he is. I didn't say he's God, but he's God's child. So if God is everything and all sufficient and you're his child, then what is it that he doesn't have for you that you can't do? Even though it's grabbing the snake by the tail and not by the head. You can make a difference in your community, young people, even in your classroom. You can make a difference on your football team, your basketball team. You can make a difference in your, your, your clubs, your groups. You can make a difference in your community. There was a young man named David, about 17 years old. There was this real big guy named Goliath. The Bible says he was like nine feet, six inches tall. How many people know how big Shaq is? Shaq is like 7'2". Goliath was 9'6". And all the warriors were scared of him. <laughs> you know, rough guy, you know. Scared. But David knew who he was, and he knew who his God was. And David said yes, even before he was really asked. David said, listen, I'm going to go do this guy. And because David said yes, the whole nation of Israel was delivered from the Philistines. Listen to me. There's something that God's got for you to do that if you'll say yes, you might not only change your life, you'll change somebody else's life. I'm, I'm not kidding you. I'm being real with you. But you got to believe God enough that's in you to use you just as you are and change you when he needs to change you so that you can be what he wants you to be. God is real. He's very real. If you were to ask me 30 years ago, would I be standing here? No way in the world. But he can change you, and he can use you even with your dysfunction. Can I get a witness? Amen. Before I go to the next question, let me leave you with this. You're going to say yes to somebody and something. 
and your yes is going to determine your future. Now, either you're going to say yes to God and know that God as a great father has got a good future for you. I didn't say an easy future. I said a good future. I didn't say easy because sometimes it's hard and it's still good. Or you can say yes to some things and people that you should have said no to. Now y'all quiet. Let me say this in two minutes. In my youth, there were times I should have said yes to God and I didn't. And it cost me. Down the road. It didn't as much cost me then. But it cost me later. You're going to say yes. The key is, will you say yes to God? Because you're going to say yes to somebody or something. And it will be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap it. If you say yes to God, anybody that's ever said yes to God can't say that they've had bad in their life. Listen to me. I didn't say it wasn't easy. I know there's some stuff. But whatever you've said yes to for God, God has blessed you. Gar gu guaranteed. Whatever you said yes to that wasn't God, more often than not, you had some problems down the road. They didn't come right away. But when they came, you wish they had gone away. And you didn't know what to do with it. And, you, and thank God he's the God of redemption. But I'm trying to get y'all to not have to use him as the redeeming God in that way. So say yes to God now instead of having to try to fix it later. Because some things that are small, you can fix. And some things you say yes to right now may not get fixed as easily. They, can, Pastor, can I be real for a second? It only takes one time to sleep with a person to get AIDS. They're old enough, trust me. They see more than that, what I just said. You said yes. Cost you. Cost you more than you thought you had. You ain't got enough money. Church quiet. That's all right, Pastor. I'm going to get out of here. Not only will I be what God made me to be, not, will I, not, not only will I use what, what God has gave me to use, has given me to use, will I do what God tells me? You've got to have an acceptance test. You've got to have an availability test. And you've got to have an action test. If you read this passage, nowhere in this passage that God's talking to Moses, does Moses say, Okay, God, yes. Re read it. When you get home, study it. Nowhere in this passage does God say, I hear you, I got it, yes. But you know what I know? He says yes because the Bible says he takes his family, he takes his staff, and he goes back to Egypt. God is not interested in you saying yes if you won't do yes. Talk is cheap, takes money to buy land. And God is not looking for your yes to be a off and off and on one time thing. God is looking for your yes to be a lifestyle. Moses has got a change of life now. He can't go back to being a shepherd anymore. Listen. He's put his hands to the plow. He's going into Egypt. God's assured him. He said, listen, all the ones that wanted you dead are dead. Trust me, go back to Egypt. But that doesn't mean that even though the ones that were, are dead when you left, that were alive and they're dead now, that doesn't mean you ain't going to make more enemies. That doesn't mean there won't still be some people out there that can't stand you. But I need you to not just say yes. I need you to do yes. I need you to live yes. 
I need you to live yes in accepting who I am. I need you to live yes in accepting who you are. I need you to live yes in accepting your limitations. I need you to live yes in accepting that I can use you past your dysfunction. I need you to say yes and live, live yes in knowing that I can take what you have and use what you have. But it's no good if you won't do it. So the Bible says, Moses took his family, and I love this. The Bible says, and he took the staff of God. Y'all ain't catch it. God asked him, what do you have? He said, I got a staff. That's all I got. I got a staff. Basically, God's implying, you've got what? A staff. Whose staff? My staff. Moses. Mine. I've been using it. God says, I can use what you have. So after God gets done dealing with him and Moses decides to go back, the Bible says when Moses goes back, he doesn't go back with his staff. The Bible says that he takes the staff of God. It was the same staff, but he's now giving it to God. Nothing had changed about the staff. The staff didn't mysteriously change. What changed was the ownership of the staff because Moses gave his staff over to God. He gave what he had. Will you be what God made you to be? Will you be what God made you to be? That's kind of weak, y'all. Let me try. Yeah. Will you be what God made you to be? Will, will you be what God made you to be? Yes! <laughs> will you be what God made you to be? Yes! Will you use what God has given you to use? Will you use what God's given you to use? Yes! Will you use it? Yes! <laughs> Will you do what he tells you to do? Yes! It's all right. That's honest. That's honest. It's honest. Listen. If you trust God just to say yes, he will strengthen you. Trust me when I tell you that. It ain't going to be easy all the time. It's not. You're going to be different. You're going to be different. You're going to be different. And it's okay to be different for God. It's okay to not be like everybody else and to be just what God wants you to be. And old head young people, It's not too late to change right where you are. We can't undo yesterday. But we're going forward. God's not the God of yesterday. Yeah, we know he was in yesterday, but God's always moving forward. Amen? All God ever wanted from us was our yes. God's favorite word. You sure it ain't don't? Stop. No. God's favorite word for his children. Yes. In Christ, everything is yea and amen. God bless you. Sing, brother, sing, sing, sing.
Somebody needs to know today. Somebody needs to know that Jesus Christ has come, lived, died, been buried, risen, ascended for you. If somebody out here today has not said yes to the Lord, yes to Jesus, yes to accepting that he is God in flesh, yes to, to accepting that he's all sufficient for you, now's your opportunity to say yes, Lord. I, I, I'm a mess. I stutter. I'm a mess. I lie. I'm a mess. I cheat. I'm a mess from the floor up. But in your strength, even knowing my weakness, I need you to save me. And God will save you right there, just like that. He'll work on sanctifying you, but he wants to save you. He wants to redeem you, and he needs you to say yes. So if there's one today and you have not said yes, I'm offering God, the God of the yes, for you to meet with him and give him your yes so that you might be redeemed. And don't worry about all the other stuff. God will start working on that. He'll work on your cheating, your lying. He'll, he'll work on all that. He'll work on that. But you got to say yes. If there's one and you're unsaved, second call. You said yes to the Lord accepting him. But you don't have a church home. You just saw it. If you were here long enough. There's going to be a new pastor. They're, 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 they're looking into getting a new permanent pastor for this house. We thank God for the pastor of this house right now. For what God's doing in and through him and believing God will do in and through this next one, whomever that be, what he wants for his house. So if God's calling you to this house, then trust God enough to grab it by the tail. You haven't even seen who the person really is. You haven't seen the person face to face. You haven't talked to the person. But you've got to trust the God that told you to pick it up. That's the second call. And the third call is going to be if there's somebody that is struggling with saying yes. We'd just like to pray for you. You're struggling with saying yes to God. You say yes to God when the things are that you understand and like and are easy but you're having a hard time saying yes to God for who he is and even in who you are we're going to ask you to come down front if you are one of those folk just that we might pray with you that's all God's able to change you not me God's able to change all of us if we let him if there's one waiting on you. Don't wait on God. He's already done what he's going to do. If there's one. Yes. See none. You may take your seat. Take your seat. Let's give the Lord praise for the message and the messenger. Shout yes to the Lord. Shout yes to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Stand to your feet. Reminding you that the bus will be leaving at 1.30. I recognize that there's some people that have the same condition I have, so we got to get a little snack or something uh, because we got an hour and a half ride ahead of us, and we know we can't go that long without having something. So grab something quickly from the upper room. 1.30, we're ready to go. Father, we praise and we thank you, God, for this youth day. Thank you for Pastor Phillips as he came and shared your word. Thank you for the challenge to it, not just the youth, but to every one of us. That all of you, what you are about is yes and amen, and that's in Christ Jesus.